Good evening, everyone. Uh, as we move from the endless days of online classes, uh, the Science Club of Aisa Pune is extremely thrilled to welcome all of you to our first in-person alumni session today with Surojit Sural from one of the first batches of Aisa Pune, batch of 2012. On behalf of the entire Science Club team, I gladly welcome you to this uh, session. Uh, many alumni sessions have been conducted throughout the year, and uh, this would be very special to all of us, and we hope all of you enjoy it too. Before we begin, a couple of things to clear up. Uh, the session is being live streamed on YouTube channel, on our YouTube channel. This will be a meet and greet session, so feel free to ask your questions. You can raise your hand, and uh, we'll be taking up your questions one by one. Um, we will also be taking questions from the YouTube audience as well, so they will be putting in the comments, and we'll be seeing them online, and we'll be asking it accordingly. Uh, our speaker today, um, Mr. Suraj Sural, graduated with a BSMS dual degree from Aisa Pune, where he majored in biology and was the gold medalist of his batch. He did his MS thesis in the lab of Dr. Mayurika Lairi. He then moved to US and enrolled as a PhD student in the University of Michigan. After graduating with a PhD degree in molecular and integrative physiology from the University of Michigan, Suraj joined Professor Oliver Hobart's lab at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, HHMI, Columbia University in New York, where he is currently investigating how the nervous system remodels in response to environmental changes and how this influences animal behavior in, favorable con in unfavorable conditions. So now, over to the audience. Uh, ple please feel free to ask your questions now. Okay. So uh, would you like to give a short introduction? Sure, yeah. Uh, it's really good to be back here. Uh, I, s I was the second batch of ICER Pune. Back then, it used to be in the Sai Trinity building, uh, but then it feels really good to be in a campus, in a real campus, because when I left in 2012, this campus was just starting. Uh, the current guest house used to be our hostel, uh, it used to be Hall of Residence 4, and uh, but now it feels like a real campus. So. I'm glad that you guys are experiencing the full ISAR experience, even though we had a wonderful time. I think there were some pros of the time back then was the class sizes were much smaller. Uh, when ISAR started, the first batch had only 44 students, all disciplines combined. Next batch, our batch was 55 students. So I guess every faculty knew every student in all the departments. It's impossible right now to have that situation also with int PhDs and PhDs. Um, but I guess ISAR has grown a lot. It, it's really good to see all things represented. Uh, back then, they had to invite people from TIFR and other places to teach courses. So they came and they took multiple hours of lectures in a day uh, and then they left. So we studied in these modules, but now there are enough professors to teach all the different subjects and it's, it's a really great thing that to see ICER Pune grow so much. Such. So feel free to ask me anything um, you would want to know about my uh, background, my time here in ICER and what I did after that. Um. Hello sir. Sir, how you decided to do major in biology? So for me, it was a little bit easy because I wanted to do biology research since I was in class sixth or something. Uh, I had a very good teacher in school, uh, M. Lakshmi Narayan. Uh, he encouraged people to study biology beyond memorization, rote memorization. He said that think of it as an adaptable system where you can change things to improve the system, something that was not introduced earlier than that. Uh, so that got me really interested and genetic engineering, changing genes to change uh, organismal function was coming up in the late 90s, um, early 2000s. So it was very exciting back then, the possibility that you can change the genome of organisms and get the desired traits in the fruits and the vegetables and uh, any like domesticated cattle and so on. Uh, I. I moved a lot during my school years uh, because my dad back then uh, he was working for the government. 
but I noticed that most of the people around me wanted to do either engineering or medicine. Uh, science was definitely a backup option for somebody who doesn't get any of these things uh, and this was in uh, Nagpur, in the city of Nagpur. Uh, so and I told my parents that I want to do biological research, I don't know how to do it, so I want to move to a place that has more opportunities. So I moved to Delhi for my 11th and 12th, uh, thinking that it's the national capital, I should be able to find uh, more options about careers. I did not meet scientists directly, but then there were more opportunities in some way. For example, uh, back then ICER used to take students from three streams. One was the KVPI stream, which I think still exists. Yes. Um, the second was the IIT JE stream, which I don't know. It's still, it's still there. Okay. The third was the Olympiad stream, which I think no longer exists. I don't think so. Yeah. So there are these international Olympiads that some of you are familiar with, like Math Olympiad, Physics Olympiad. Uh, so while I was in school, uh, there was this exam that we had to take, and then there was a second round, and there was a third round. So to select the team that would represent India in the International Biology Olympiads. Uh, and if you qualify to be in the final 20, then you are eligible for admission into ICERS. So that was my way into ICERS and the way I got to know about ICERS was, I, I used to read newspapers back then looking for different opportunities and then there was this thing that like the IITs are for technology and IIMs are for management, they are starting ICERS where undergraduates can get research experience right from uh, early years of their training and uh, they will be taught by scientists, so which was very exciting for me at that point that I can experience that. I do not have to do BSc and maybe I get some experience in MSc, I can get into that right away. Uh, so I was super excited, uh, I, I qualified through both IITJ stream and the Olympiad stream but I decided to, because the Olympiad results came earlier, I um, applied primarily through the Olympiad stream. Uh, and then I had to decide between ICERS, back then it was only Kolkata, Pune and um, I think it was the first year of Mohali, uh, so there was, uh, there were no students at all. Uh, but yeah, Pune sounded very attractive to me for multiple reasons, their biology department was already growing, they recruited some people, uh, for me it was easy. But I. I think I was probably one of the two or three people who knew they would do biology in ICER because primarily all the students were coming through the IIT JE stream and these were people who did coaching and they had only physics, chemistry, maths in their background. But what was remarkable is that many people actually loved biology but hated the rote memorization and possibly making the diagrams which not everyone is good at drawing. So when they came here, the culture here was totally different. People said you do not have to memorize things, just focus on logic. This is a very logical subject. You have to remember some things, but you do not have to remember everything. So and once you go past this initial memorization, there is a lot of interesting questions you can ask that involves physics, computation, mathematics, chemistry. Uh, so many of these people switched from chemistry, physics, even mathematics to biological uh, sciences. So they decided to take the risk and major in biology. The structure was slightly different there, uh, different back then. Uh, back then there was a lot of focus on interdisciplinarity. So we were not allowed to major in anything back then, that we had to take courses but it was totally free, you could take courses from any discipline, there was no uh, requirement that you have to take from uh, this many from one discipline. Uh, I took mostly, uh, so first two years we had to study all the subjects, uh, of course the four sciences, uh, we also had some earth science, some humanities, um, interdisciplinary stuff. From, uh, from third and fourth year we had to study um, whatever we want again, but I decided to mostly do a major even though it is not written on my degree, I, um, I, I took mostly biology courses, some chemistry courses to understand uh, the biological, the chemical aspects of biology better. And then uh, fifth year was here in ICER uh, because there was the option to go to any place in the world and do your fifth year project, but I really, I thought I knew the system here really well, so I wanted to stay back for my fifth year 
uh, while I was applying for PhD. So that was the story right from the school level till my journey in biology in ISA. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, could you please shed some light on your MS thesis, as in uh, what made you decide your topic of thesis? How did you go about it? Uh, what all did you have to look up for while you pursued research on that topic? Which professor you worked under and? Sure. You should also mention your name so that. Oh, uh, hi, I'm Nilanshi, first year. Okay. Uh, so the master's thesis was decided during the course of things, of course. Uh, I knew I liked biology. Uh, I liked cancer because some people in my extended family got cancer and uh, cancer was very hot back then and still is very hot um, field as such. Um, and the closest we had was uh, Dr. Mayurika Lahiri who was one of the first uh, hires in the biology department. So what I did is. Uh, first two years we had a lot of courses and we didn't have time to work full time in a lab. Uh, I did apply for these uh, summer programs. So first year I went to JNCSR, Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research in Bangalore. They have, they used to have, I think they still have a program known as SURF, Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship. Uh, and I worked there uh, in a lab and then I came back second year of courses and this time I applied for again more summer um, research opportunities and after my second year I went to this institute known as National Institute of Genetics in Japan. Uh, they also had a summer internship program called the NIG intern program. Uh, it was a wonderful experience uh, both science wise and uh, culture wise because uh, Japan is a fantastic country and I was just 19 years old so I was um, going crazy I guess. Uh, but before that step, when I was towards the end of my second year, I said used to have, I think it still has the semester projects that you can do, uh, you get credit for that um, and then you work in a lab. So many people use different strategies. So they, you have four semesters before you have to commit to your fifth year thesis. Uh, many, some people wanted to sample as many fields as possible. So they tried four different things and picked whatever they liked best. But I feel, this is my personal opinion again, that for research you have to go a little bit deep. Our interests are primarily shaped by what we know and our background and our experiences. If somebody is doing research in a field and they are getting funds from the government to do that research, it is important. It's just that we don't find it interesting enough because probably we don't understand the logic that much. So for me it was important to go deep into something and understand that topic well enough so that I can make some significant contributions to the field during my master's thesis. And if I am able to do that then I can, it makes me very competitive for a PhD program. Because if I say I have sampled five different areas, they are like okay but how, PhD is going, diving into a topic completely and um, exploring it. So you definitely want to show more depth than breadth I guess in that level. Uh, so I started in Mayurika's lab. Another reason was that Mayurika is a fantastic mentor. She really gives you the freedom to think. Uh, she's very supportive. You can ask her anything, um, not just related to science, but if you are facing any problems in managing coursework and other things. Uh, so I had a wonderful experience. I had no reason to change uh, to a different lab. But the project I was working on back then was how DNA damaging compounds, uh, what are the pathways that they activate that result in cancer formation. So this is something that I was studying for the first, um, my third and fourth year. And then I did, I tried multiple different strategies around the same question which also gives you a more complete view of what are the different techniques. And I was talking to the other faculty as well. For example, uh, I was stuck in protein purification at one point and Mayurika said, oh, this new faculty has joined Thomas Pukadil, uh, go and talk to him. So 
I talked to Thomas about protein purification. So back then it was, you can use any technique that is available. ICER still does not have that structure where you are restricted by a lab. So you are asking a question, but then you can use any of the tools available in the entire institute, not just the department. So in my fourth year, uh, then many people move to different, I, I think back then the physics and math departments were very small and those people were forced to go to other places. So they had a reason to go to other places. Biology was doing really uh, well and for me it was more of a logistical thing. I did not want to take a break after my BSMS work as a research tech before applying. I just wanted to go right into PhD. So if I went to a lab outside ICER, first few months will be adjusting to that new city. Then next few months I have to impress the PI and show them that I am smart enough to do a PhD. Uh, but then you know how the PhD application cycle is. It is if you have to join in uh, the fall semester of 2023, you have to apply November in November of this year. So it is very early. So your fifth year starts and in a matter of few months you have to apply. And it is very difficult to get a very personalized letter from the person if they have only known you for 5 or 6 months, right. So I decided because Mayurika knew me very well and she gave me total freedom in terms of you pick your question, these are the options you have. Um, so we in the third and fourth year we were mostly doing our experiments in uh, cultured human cell lines. So these are cells grown on, grown on these plastic plates. But we know that cells normally do not grow on plastic. So their behavior is very different, uh, their uh, not just behavior, their uh, morphology, their biochemistry, everything can be potentially different inside the animal. So the organoid thing was coming up that we make these structures where we give all the growth factors to allow these cells to differentiate into structures that resemble the tissue inside the animal. So Mayurika wanted to develop these organoid structures and this was a three dimensional culture of breast uh, epithelial cells that would be a very good model to study uh, breast cancer. Uh, so it starts from a single cell, uh, it was tried by one lab, uh, it was developed by one lab in Harvard and um, one lab in UC Berkeley and uh, they were able to make this and it was still in the initial stages. So we had the papers, I ha just had to reproduce it so that we can ask biological, our biological questions using that model. So it was very exciting to learn something um, that was not established uh, in India back then. Uh, so I started working on this, it was very frustrating but I had the other safe project going on, the thing that I was working on in my third and fourth year. So that was going on in the site and this was something that I was doing long term more uh, exploratory if we can get the system working. So we start from a single cell and then it becomes a ball of cells and then the cells inside die. So it is a hollow structure which is more similar to the how the tissue looks like inside the animal. And then you get polarity. So there is apical side and basal side, the pro, there are different proteins on either side suggesting that it is getting more closer to the uh, actual tissue structure. So this was. Uh, what my master's thesis turned out to be and then I also did other experiments that got into a paper. Uh, the paper got published much later but I could present this work in a conference that was happening in um, uh, CMC Vellore, Christian Medical College Vellore. Uh, they have a huge symposium where, where they invite all the alumni of CMC across the world uh, and it was a good experience for me to present my work there. Uh, so even though I did not have a paper back then. Um, Mayurika gave a very strong letter and I had some of these internships, one in Bangalore after my first year, one in Japan after my second year and I continued doing that in the summers because that was a good opportunity to sample the research culture in different countries. So there is this fellowship known as DAD or DAAD, uh, so I went to Germany on a DAD fellowship, uh, studied a different biological question but also related to cancer. Fourth year. Uh, after fourth year I went to the UK which was a collaboration between ICER and the University of Southampton back then because at that point I was debating whether I want to stick to basic research or if I want to do applied research. So I worked in an applied cancer lab where they were developing drugs 
to treat can cancer, so very direct applications. And this helped me, helped me in two ways. Firstly, understanding the research cultures in different countries and whether I want to live in that country for three to six years to do my PhD and also exposed me to different approaches to study a biological question. And overall, based on all that, I decided that considering the fact that if I move to another country or even another city, it will be a big change and I do not want that. It takes up a lot of time from my fifth year. I decided to stay back in ISA. But many of my friends went to other places, published fantastic work in that one year. Uh, and it helped them as well. So either strat strategy works. I am, uh, for me, it worked in this manner uh, because I had a mentor who had uh, my back. I felt comfortable that this person will support me in my next step. Uh, I communicated very freely with uh, my advisor right from the beginning um, of my time in ISER. And uh, she also was very open about what she felt and uh, what I was doing wrong, what I was doing right, very uh, encouraging. So finding a good mentor is very important. Biological question, I think once you work in a question for a while, uh, the initial thing is the struggle, uh, just reading the literature. But once you have developed some understanding, then it starts getting interesting. Then I think everything is interesting. It's just that uh, you have to go a little bit deeper and then take the call rather than take the call within a semester. Maybe spend a year and see if you uh, absolutely don't like it, then it's a different thing. But uh, read enough, interact, understand all the projects that's going on in that lab, all the what the other PhD students are working on, um, and read what is happening in the field outside ISER and outside India, uh, and that will let you know that uh, if you would want to do that in the future or not. But again, w during this time, I knew that I did not want to continue this for my PhD. Uh, but I wanted to finish this. I have this attitude that if I start something, I want to finish this. Uh, so I finished this, but then I moved to a totally different system uh, in my PhD that I am happy to talk about later. But that was uh, my master's thesis. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I have a bunch of questions. Um, uh, so. What are your interests, by the way, till uh, now? My, my interest is in biology, okay. uh, mostly cytology and genetics, okay. uh, and some word uh, neural system. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm still reading stuff on it, so I'm not sure mm -hmm. which exactly uh, it is. But um, about the summer internships, how you went to Japan and everything, how did you come across these? Was it uh, like, did any professor mention it, or did you have to go and look these things up? Uh, it was a mixture. Uh, I think initially, uh, I, I definitely used to Google for summer internship opportunities and also see if they are, because some places now are charging you for a summer internship, uh, which of course I do not want to pay from my pocket for that. Uh, there are places where they support everything, your airfare, your accommodation, they give you a stipend to survive. So definitely I was looking for those opportunities. Uh, for the first one, I think, uh, Dr. Sutir Day told me about this because he did his PhD from JNCSR and he said that they have this summer internship. They have multiple options. So they have something known as uh, POBE, POSE, so which is program in uh, biological education, where which is a three year. So you have to commit yourself for three years to the program. So you go there uh, every summer for the first three summers and then you get considerable volume of work done in the summers as such. Uh, and then. Uh, they have like this one semester, uh, one summer commitment, which is the SURF program. For the Japan thing, what happened is, as you might know, Japan's population pyramid is inverted at this point. So most people are very old and then there are very few kids. So they, ha they actually have to close down primary schools because they do not have enough kids um, for that. So they need a lot of people in their workforce. So they really wanted to get young people into their PhD programs. Um, and they, it, it's a little bit more difficult for them because they're not uh, an English speaking nation. So they don't get applications from many countries. It's mostly Southeast Asia, some from China, but they wanted to expand to India. So I think they had a formal, so back then ISER was new and they wanted to make their global presence felt. So they were making these international uh, collaborations. So one was with this institute. So people from uh, 
this place visited ICER and they talked about this program and that is how I got to know about it and I applied. DART was pretty well known I guess the uh, Germany one there is another the Khorana fellowship which I never got but I think it is another very prestigious fellowship. Uh, they might have changed the name now though. Um, so, that is for uh, summer internship in the US. Um, yeah, DARD is something um, where you just need a host lab. So, you have to convince the professor that I have the money. Uh, if you accept me, I have the money uh, and you have to give the letter of support, uh, which again is um, for all sciences. I mean, people from physics, uh, mathematics, chemistry, they also went for the DARD fellowships. Uh, and the final one at that summer I was debating whether I should go for an internship or should I just use those summer months for my fifth year. But at that point I was in a real dilemma whether I want to do applied research or not. Um, so, I am glad I did that and I did not find it that stimulating because uh, for some people applied research is really good because it is very targeted. You have to develop this drug to treat this disease or develop this thing as an engineering problem to solve this. Uh, but it is a more of a pipeline thing. So, some people get the motivation that they are actually solving a real world problem and they see it being solved and that give, gives immense happiness. For me, because I was trained in the ICER system, I was more exploratory and I wanted to test hypothesis, do things that have not been done before and that is a little bit difficult, you know, if you see how the clinical trials and other stuff is done. Uh, so, this was again uh, and this was called Yuki Eri, United Kingdom, India something ex exchange stuff. So, uh, some students from ICER uh, again had to find hosts in three different um, universities in the United Kingdom and uh, ICER sponsored the flight and visa fees and uh, the university sponsored the stay over there and the stipend over there. So, yeah, I was fortunate, uh, but I think now there are even more summer uh, research fellowships that have opened up. If you just Google, there are opportunities in Ireland, in the U United States, it is always difficult because of the visa issues, uh, but European countries, Japan, uh, I would say I strongly recommend. Uh, Japan, I liked so much. Uh, I would rank it as one of the highest among my experiences. I even applied for PhD. Uh, I got the position. But I was debating between the University of Michigan um, in Ann Arbor in the US uh, and Japan and then uh, multiple professors here told me that see one part of PhD is learning how to communicate science both in presentations as well as in writing. Uh, and in Japan you might not be able to develop your English communication skills because uh, yeah you, you might not get good training in that regard. So, that was the only reason. Science wise I think both were pretty equivalent, uh, but yeah this is how uh, most searching on Google and sometimes opportunities come up, professors tell about things, somebody visits, uh, attend as many talks as possible. You never know what comes up in a slide um, in the end. Maybe they are some uh, visitor from another university is uh, advertising a summer internship position over there. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, right now, you mentioned something about finding a host. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure. I understand that. So okay, okay. Finding a host laboratory. Yeah. So it means that so way DARD works. DARD is uh, the translation is German Academic Exchange Service or something. Uh, so the way DARD works uh, is. It is operated at the ministry level and there is a GPA cutoff for applying and they would sponsor everything. They would give you health insurance during your stay in Germany, they would pay for your flight tickets, uh, they would give you a stipend. They even have a da DART conference in the middle. It is a weekend where you have to go and uh, uh, you interact with the other DART fellows uh, in uh, Berlin. Uh, but then they would not decide which lab you will be going to. So, you have to email individual labs in uh, which I also had to do for the UK thing. You have to find individual labs in Germany and you have to contact. I do not know if DART does this the same way though. It was the thing back then. You have to contact them, write emails which again I strongly recommend before you send an email to a professor, show it 
the email show the draft email to a professor over here scientific writing is very specific and we normally don't write in that way when we are communicating uh, show it to a professor and incorporate any of the changes that they recommend uh, how to structure so you would normally send your cv and you would send a cover letter that has a brief description of your research interests if you have any research experience in icer or uh, elsewhere and what you exactly want to do that is the most important thing they because the problem with dart is there are blanket applications somebody has made uh, because this is open to uh, many institutes iit icers etc nits as well uh, somebody wrote a code where it emails every single professor in germany uh, with a very generic email uh, and this is not how things should be done because uh, you have to write those emails and the proposals very specifically uh, they want to know if you have read about their work if you have read any of their papers uh, you have to show that level of interest and there might be some back and forth um, email communication before um, they might actually give you an offer letter contingent upon you getting the dart fellowship so this is the process of finding the host laboratory that will host you for the summer thank you so much okay. any other question Uh, so you've also uh, been a graduate tutor and you've had some teaching experiences in some areas too. Mm -hmm. So how was your experience in, uh, you know, being a teacher and a tutor and an instructor? Yeah, it was wonderful. I, I really love teaching. I hope I could do more teaching um, and hope people incorporated it in different stages of the training. So my PhD program was in a physiology department molecular and integrative physiology department this is a medical school department this is the same department that teaches human physiology uh, to doctors uh, but then in the us th the way the medical system works is you first do your bachelor's and then you apply for medical school so it's not like here where you apply right after your 12th so there are a lot of people who take human physiology so we call these people pre meds so these are people who are majoring in something neuroscience biology chemistry uh, even biomedical engineering and then they would take these med school related courses uh, and then apply for med school after they graduate after they have a bachelor's degree so we had uh, this big human physiology course that was attended by all the pre meds because they need to know about the human body right and the PhD students in the physiology department, they used to be uh, the teaching assistants. So this was a huge class, uh, I think 250 students. And this is a very complex subject because if you think about it, it went from one organ system to the other. First you study about the brain for a week, then you study about the heart for a week, then you study about the muscles for a week, then you gastrointestinal system, uh, skeletal system, uh, kidney, uh, endocrine system and it reproductive system and goes on and then you incorporate these things together for example uh, if the adrenal gland functions how does it affect blood pressure how does that affect kidney function how does that affect reproduction and so then there are a lot of these interactions which can get highly confusing for undergraduates who have to remember everything from the beginning of the course to answer those questions so definitely TAs had a very tough time uh, in this course but uh, what I did is I led a discussion section after the classes where there were small, uh, there were about 35 students and they came up with their own doubts or sometimes I went over the topics in detail, had some um, objective type questions to uh, go over the things that they went over in class. So that was very interesting uh, in terms of getting to teach undergraduates and help them uh, resolve their doubts because people come from very different backgrounds somebody ha knows more biology for them it's slightly easier they want to go even more advanced others had basic fundamental doubts because they did not take enough biology in school uh, but again I mean I would any day love to teach in India more than uh, that in the US because the system is very different there uh, I'm more familiar with this system and I have uh, I feel more connected when I teach in the Indian system. Uh, I actually, uh, 
my MS thesis advisor Mayurika allowed me to take one lecture in her course uh, in my fifth year, uh, which was very enjoyable for me um, as such. But then, uh, yeah, in PhD I had this proper, and then the, of course there was grading and other things that I had to do. Uh, grading uh, 250 answers, subjective answers was not fun. It was one week of continuous grading, no lab work. Uh, but then, uh, it was really good to see students who are now able to understand these complex concepts, because these are highly complex for anyone who is entering the field, but over the semester they got more used to it. And I enjoyed this so much that I actually did some more teaching, uh, but this time outside the university. So, I, so before I go into that, I also tutored one PhD student, because this student was from China and she had some language problems, so she had difficulty in following uh, things in the lectures. So, uh, she was one year below me in the program. So, uh, because I had already taken the course, I was tutoring her in that course and helping her with um, understanding things from the lecture and uh, understanding even questions in the assignment. She was incredibly intelligent. I mean, this is something that I have realized that we should not judge a person's intelligence based on their English speaking ability. It is a totally different skill set. The moment she got comfortable with the language, she published research papers every year and graduated with so many discoveries in her PhD. It is just that there is a difference in culture and a difference in, uh, uh, there is a major uh, lack of confidence, because they are not able to communicate um, uh, that well in English. But somebody's potential to become a scientist is totally unrelated to that. Uh, and I hope we appreciate this more. Um, and of course, we have to learn English, because research, scientific research is mostly communicated in English at, a, at an international level. There are still papers written in French or Japanese, but then they do not get that much of uh, readership, unfortunately, because very few people outside these countries can read them. Now, coming back to the thing I mentioned that I did more teaching. So, what happened is, there is a professor called Dr. Uh, Actually, she is a doctor as well as a professor in the uh, gynecology department in the University of Michigan. Uh, Senet Fesia, I think that is her name. She is originally from Ethiopia in Africa, Eastern Africa. Uh, and she has been in the US for a long time, but she wants to give back to the country now that she is established. So, Ethiopia is a country that is still a developing or underdeveloped uh, nation. It is growing very fast. In the next decade or so, it will be the 10th most populated country in the world. Uh, it has a very young population. And this is a very big country, but the entire country has only had only three medical schools uh, in the big cities. So, Addis Ababa is the capital. And the Ministry of Health there wanted to expand the number of medical schools. So, they decided to open 10 more medical schools. But the thing was designing the curriculum of these medical schools. and also the lag, because they cannot hire enough faculty to teach. And they wanted to change this thing. So, normally the three medical schools had very didactical method of teaching. So, like one way instruction, slide, 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 hundreds of slides goes through. Uh, but they wanted to make it more interactive, that like the US system, where the lecturer stops, asks questions, listens to multiple people, and then integrates those, so that it is a much more interactive and also there are group activities as such. So, that is why they wanted uh, people who are more familiar with the US system to come in and set up the curriculum in these medical colleges. So, it was a wonderful experience for me. Uh, I was teaching biochemistry to first year medical students in um, this medical college in a very small town called Yergalem, which is in southern Ethiopia. And uh, just visiting Africa was remarkable. I mean, visiting the continent, uh, seeing the culture, seeing the people, the landscape, the wildlife, everything was wonderful. But then also interacting with these people, it gave me so much pleasure. And I still have some of those teaching uh, evaluations, where uh, 
they were so generous with their feedback. They were so happy that somebody was letting them speak in class and trying to make it interactive because they were used to this one way learning method. And uh, I think it, and this was also at the time of my PhD where we have to take this candidacy exam. And if you pass this candidacy exam, then you uh, go to the next stage of your PhD. Uh, so, I was a little bit exhausted mentally at that point and I needed a break, wanted to do something and this was so refreshing in that way. Just going to a country, talking to people who really wanted to learn and uh, interacting with them uh, in a professional capacity, helping them develop their scientific thinking in terms of hypothesis building and so on, which I think doctors should have. I mean, doctors should think like scientists, which helps them. Uh, some doctors are really talented and they are better at diagnosis than others, but uh, this is the disease landscape is a very evolving thing and people need to keep up with the literature and all. So, I was there for about six weeks, um, one week of orientation, just getting to know the country and what to do uh, and then we moved to the site where we actually taught. Um, so, there was one more student with me in this college and there were other students who went to the other colleges. Um, setting up the curriculum over there. Uh, and yeah, this is the teaching official teaching experience I have had, but I have also participated in many outreach events uh, during my PhD work. Uh, so, people think of the US as a very uh, advanced country. Yes, it is advanced, but there is a lot of poverty. There is a lot of wealth inequality, which is very disturbing. So, there are schools where even the toilets are not clean. There are this fungus growing on the walls. Uh, and there is very little funds for these um, elementary primary schools as such. So, we used to go to and again many um, African American or black dominated neighborhoods. So, again a large of race based disparity exists uh, over there. So, I uh, went to these uh, schools and we got some sheep brains. Actually, we got them from Amazon which was interesting that Amazon was selling uh, sheep brains and we dissected the sheep brains and showed them the different parts of the brain. Uh, these were fixed brains, of course, not fresh, uh, fixed in um, formaldehyde, uh, formalin. And then we showed what different parts of the brain do and these kids were so excited. I mean, it's uh, of course, not all of them would end up being scientists, but just showing them this possibility of looking at a live or brain from a live animal and uh, how the brain looks, the brain structure looks like internally and what it means in terms of memory formation and those things. Uh, so, it was a very rewarding experience and I participated in many other outreach events where I saw that many students were, uh, school student kids were there in ISER today. So, things like that always happen and then um, I participated in those. Due to COVID, uh, I have not been able to participate in that as much, uh, but I have always wanted to be connected to teaching in some way or the other. Um, not just in a classroom capacity, but also reaching out to uh, kids at a very early level, getting them interested in science. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it is really nice to hear how you, how it helped the other students around you and how much you love teaching, uh, which is very, I mean, it is very interesting to hear how you went to different regions, how their culture is and how you had an impact on them. And sure that they would have enjoyed it too. Yes. Um, any other questions? Okay. Myself Prashant, mm -hmm. second year BSMS student, struggling to choose my basic interest in which I should major or further increase my interest. Mm -hmm. How you fascin How was you fascinated to pursue in neurobiology and switching from physiology? Uh, good point. <laughs> okay. So, what happened? I will take you through the entire journey. So, as I mentioned, I, here I was developing these uh, organoid structures where I was studying how DNA damage results in change in structure of the tissue. So, one of the professors suggested that if you want to study stress, why do not study this in the context of a full an, full organism. So, I uh, I wanted to study this in an invertebrate system, I mean not mammalian systems like mouse because first of all uh, doing experiments with mouse is a little bit difficult. 
it depends on the question. For certain questions, you have to study them in mouse. But for uh, these things where you are talking, uh, where you want to use a lot of genetics and other things, then definitely Drosophila and C. elegans are very good models. So I, I knew about Drosophila from here because I, I said Pune has a lot of Drosophila labs. But I, uh, so I did two Drosophila lab rotations in my PhD. Uh, so we had to do uh, at least three rotations. Uh, so, two were Drosophila labs, one was a C. elegans lab. So, I do not know if you are familiar with C. elegans. This is a very simple multicellular organism, it is a worm, it is a nematode worm, round worm and it has only 959 somatic cells in its body. So, very, uh, there are some uh, germline cells that make eggs and sperms, but then rest of the body just 959 cells. Even though it is so simple, it has all the organ systems. It has a nervous system, it has a muscular system, reproductive system, excretory system, uh, gastrointestinal system. Uh, the only thing it does not have is bones. So, other than that, it has all the major organ systems represented. So, I was studying how stress response pathways regulate the rate of aging in these animals. So, if you increase the ability of the animal to deal with stress, does it live longer? And this is what I was studying. So, this was more from a very molecular perspective, uh, but during my PhD, what I saw, uh, what I was reading, there were a lot of papers that suggested that if you put an animal in a stressful environment, mild stress, too much stress kills the animal, but mild stress, it activates these stress response pathways that is actually beneficial in the long term. So, it helps it uh, prevent the deleterious effects of older age, so it lives longer. But what these studies showed is that it is, sometimes it is not the actual stress, but it is just the perception of stress by the nervous system that is sufficient to change the lifespan of the animal. So, let me give you an example. It is one of the most widely studied longevity pathways is called dietary restriction, eat less, live longer. So, this particular study was done in flies, but it has this has been done in other systems as well. Uh, so, in Drosophila, if you let the fly eat as much as possible, so this is called ad libitum, which means as, as much as you can, uh, they live a particular uh, lifespan, a given number of days, let us say 100 days or something. But then, when you give the animal 70 percent of its maximum capacity, 70 percent uh, that amount of food, so it is eating 30 percent less than its maximum capacity, then the animal lives much longer. So, this is fine, high calories you uh, die faster, slightly lower calories, 30 percent lower calories, you I should not say calories, because earlier they used to say caloric restriction, now they know that it matters where those calories come from. So, protein restriction has different effect than carbohydrate restriction, than fat restriction. So, people have studied this. So, that is why they say dietary restriction right now. So, as I mentioned, uh, more food, die faster, less food, live longer. But what people showed that if you put the fly in an environment where it is eating low calorie food, but then you let it smell high calorie food. So, there is a mesh, there is high calorie food over there can smell this very high calorie food, this was sufficient to shorten the lifespan of the fly. So, just the nervous system perceiving that it is in a high calorie environment is sufficient to activate those pathways and change the rest of the tissues in a way that the animal is actually uh, living shorter. So, which was very fascinating to me that uh, and this was not just shown for the eating paradigm, but also for many other paradigms in terms of. Uh, perceiving temperature, uh, because also uh, for invertebrates, they live longer at cold temperatures, they live shorter at warm temperatures. And this was thought of as a pure thermodynamic thing, that uh, chemical reactions, biological reactions are faster at high temperatures, so they, uh, there is more wear and tear, they uh, die faster. But in colder temperatures, all the reactions are slow, so everything gets stretched things live longer, but it is not the case, it is not pure thermodynamics, because if you just change the sensory perception, if you make the animal feel that it is in a 
high temperature environment that itself can change the lifespan which cannot be explained by thermodynamics right so the nervous system has taken up a very central role in regulating physiology and what it perceives in the environment supersedes what is actually present in the environment so i that's how i got very interested in understanding the sensory part of things so i had to go to a neuroscience lab for this uh, I want to come back to aging and actually what I pitched to my postdoctoral advisor is that this is I what I want to study. I want to change the function of different neurons and see how this affects lifespan. And he said that you study lifespan when you have your own lab. Uh, I have an interesting project that is related. So what he suggested to me and it sounded very interesting is remodeling of the nervous system. So this is what I talked about today um, that when organisms experience stressful conditions there is a change in their behavior so that they can survive the stress which means that a mature nervous system has the ability to change its molecular function and also its electrical activity but we do not know how this happens. So, this is what I am studying right now. So, in low nutrient environments where there is very little food the behavior of the animal changes completely. This is understandable. The animal will in high food environment. Uh, so, I study the worm even for my postdoctoral work, but this is true for think about any animal that in a high food environment, the animal will eat more, dwell more, remain in the same place for longer and it will roam less. Why does it have to roam if there is so much food? But in a low resource environment, the animal becomes more exploratory. So, there its brain has to activate pathways that makes it explore more areas and not just in one direction in multiple directions to find a more favorable condition. So, my current goal is studying how the nervous system remodels at the molecular level in uh, nutrient scarce environments where there is very uh, little nutrient present. And I am particularly studying the enteric nervous system which is the nervous system of the elementary canal. So, this is interesting. I have been always interested in neuroscience. I have taken neuroscience courses in ISER, but I always found it very overwhelming. It is so vast and the brain is so complex. There are 85 billion neurons in the brain, uh, in the human brain. But then, so that is why I moved to C. elegans, which is much simpler. It has 302 neurons. Uh, and even within that, there is a so, C. elegans so far is the only animal where the entire adult connectome is known. By connectome, I, I mean you know that neurons make synapses right with other neurons. So, we know every single connection. So, there are 302 neurons and I think there are around 10,000 synapses like this connects to this, this connects to that and so on. Uh, so, this gives us the opportunity to ask more complex questions in this system. and. Uh, Regarding the enteric nervous system, this is an even smaller set. So, out of these 302, there are 20 neurons that are very isolated from the rest of the nervous system. So, there is only one connection that connects this these 20 neurons to the rest and this is also not required for the function of. So, this is a pretty independent circuit. Now, this circuit is the circuit of the nervous system that is part of the elementary canal. So, we also have a nervous system in our elementary canal. It has millions of neurons it has all the neurotransmitters that are used in the brain at very high levels and this was initially shown hundreds of years back that if you take the intestine of the dog completely outside the animal and put it in a bath and if you just stimulate it by for example, if food is going through or you can just do mechanical stimulation, this starts contracting and relaxing and this requires synchronized electrical activity of many uh, neurons that would contract the muscles and the other uh, cells in the elementary canal. So, I am currently studying how this circuit of the elementary canal, the enteric nervous system in C. elegans changes its uh, behavior in food scarce conditions because there, because there is no food, it stops this rhythmic contraction and relaxation completely and we still do not understand how this happens at the molecular level. And this is what I am investigating that how stressful environments remodel the nervous system with a primary primary focus on the nervous system of the gut. So, that is uh, my change. Yeah. Now, you are 
researching on behavioral neuroscience yeah earlier you have taught medicine medicine science what's the difference between behavioral neuroscience and medicinal neuroscience so again i mean these are terms that we have given but these can overlap with each other medicinal neuroscience when we are talking about medicinal neuroscience we are mostly talking in the context of human brain so these are diseases of the brain can be depression can be uh uh alzheimers the old age dementia and people cannot remember things parkinsons and behavioral neuroscience is a more broad term where we are studying behavior so which we can study in um, humans as well i mean humans show a lot of behavior uh, there is uh, bipolar disorder there is uh, anxiety depression so these are different types of uh, behavioral defects uh, and then in uh, but behavior you can study in other organisms as well mouse is a very good model for studying behavior monkeys are a very good model for studying behavior but even simpler organisms that have these circuits very simple circuits also display very complex behavior for example c elegans it goes towards or away from heat depending on the context it goes towards the food source it goes towards the mate for example the male would go to mate with the uh, hermaphrodite so they don't have females they have hermaphrodites so there are all these behaviors that the animal displays and there is an underlying circuit so at the circuit level it is easier to understand behavior in simpler nervous systems as of now some day we'll have hopefully have the human connectome but still getting to the neurobiology of behavior at the circuit level uh, has always been a challenge we'll get there some day but then um, i personally feel it's simpler to study that in simpler nervous systems but again there are some things you cannot study in c elegans for example memory formation you can study memory formation in c elegans but let's say you want to study fear which is very mammalian centered right so is the worm scared how do we know it's it's very difficult to judge these things so if you want to study certain parts of the brain of the human brain like amygdala or hippocampus and how they regulate complex behaviors then you would definitely use a mammalian model but i am um, i like working with simpler systems because they are you can manipulate them very easily and you can ask bigger questions in that context uh, and it gives you more flexibility of uh, altering things so that's why i have continued working with c elegans um, as a model how much is neuroscience interdisciplinary oh extremely interdisciplinary i think honestly most people who are doing mammalian neuroscience they are just coders at this point because the data that is generated in the neuroscience field 85 billion neurons so much data electrical activity of these neurons connectome data uh, even in our lab the people who look at circuits they are pure computational biologists they are just doing python coding um, or r uh, coding and uh, using machine learning ai to solve these problems so i'm glad that icer will have a data science institute which hopefully will uh, encourage um, more collaborations in these fields uh, and then of course there are uh, people who study chemistry who want to study the uh, pharmacology of drugs in the brain and then there are uh, physicists who are also interested in the networks and how the networks result how the networks are resilient and how the networks can produce different outputs um, and of course there are biologists as such but also different types of biologists there are there's uh, developmental neuroscience who study the development of the brain from a very molecular perspective mostly there are cognitive neuroscientists who study behavior and then you have to be very particular about quantitation so you have to bring in a lot of mathematical tools and then there is um, neuro degeneration which is how the brain deteriorates in function due to old age so that's again a totally different field as such uh, so there is a lot of scope for incorporating different methods and different approaches in neuroscience it's a vast thing i another reason i chose neuroscience it might sound very stupid but i wanted to pick something that i can study for the next 30 years till i'll be active in academia and i think the brain is complex enough that you can 
it will take that much time to understand the brain. I mean, of course, we are advancing in other fields and of course, there will be much more to learn in these other fields as well. But the brain, even though we learned so much, maybe 95 percent is still unknown and uh, this gives a lot of opportunity to uh, investigate this question for uh, decades. If I am much into mammalian neurosystem, mm -hmm. what would be your suggestions for me to pursue or to read or to for labs or in topics I should get more depth into? Definitely you have to take all the neuroscience courses possible, take developmental biology courses, they have a strong uh, neuroscience component because it is interesting that many pathways that regulate the development of the brain, these pathways also become relevant later in life in the aging brain as well uh, or the adult brain. And uh, if possible take coding because this is getting more and more incorporated in all fields of neuroscience. So, build a strong coding background. Uh, some data science courses, machine learning if possible and physiology, definitely take animal physiology. Genetics would help, uh, take at least one genetics course that teaches mouse genetics um, if you want to study the mammalian brain. Uh, but yeah, if nowadays there are many other models uh, like people who study monkey brains. So, in that case you uh, do not do that much genetics, it is primarily observational as such. Uh, but it is good that in ICER, I know it is a struggle to study so many different subjects in the initial years. This comes back, if you have a basic understanding of physics and mathematics and chemistry, it makes it much easier to understand biology. Uh, so, I think the biologists benefit more from this interdisciplinary approach than the physicists or the mathematicians, uh, but you never know. I mean, um, many physicists and mathematicians and definitely chemists are interested in biological problems and uh, understanding these uh, is very important uh, at an early stage because the older you get the more resistant you get to idea uh, resistant you get to ideas so it's very difficult to learn new things at that point so learn as many things as possible and also enjoy yourself if if you feel some course is interesting just take it i mean this is the opportunity you'll i always think that oh i'll go and take this coursera course online but i never find the time to do that so take as many courses, there is no substitute for in person learning, we got to know during COVID that uh, online courses are not the same. Uh, so, you definitely want to get the best out of in person um, lectures. Thank you. There is a question in the back. Um, uh, so, you have worked in different different countries. Uh, how do you compare the research environment in these countries to India or to ISA? Your name? Uh, my name is Aditya. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's every country has its own uh, very unique style. I would say once you are in a lab, then the difference is lesser. If you are on the street interacting with people, then you will see more differences. But what is interesting is many of these people got trained in the US or Europe. So, they are, they have more similar uh, experience, you will have more similar experience inside the labs. Having said that, the system is highly dynamic. Uh, some countries have a push for applied research, but then there is a change in the government and then there is focus back on the basic research. Uh, Japan in general is a they are the hardest working people in the planet. They, the professor used to come at 7.30 in the morning and used to be there till uh, 9.30, 10. The PhD students used to come at, I do not know when, maybe 6.37 and used to be there till midnight. So, it was crazy. So, that was the first thing the professor told me in Japan that do not try to work in the Japanese schedule, you will go crazy. Uh, so, they have a very hard working culture. There is difference in hierarchy, some systems have more hierarchy, uh, even traditionally the university system in India had like senior professor, junior professor, PhD student, master student, bachelor student and so on. Uh, while other places you know people call professors uh, by their like 80 year old professors by their first name. Uh, 
Of course, it does not mean that you do not have to respect, you still have to respect the person, but then there is more uh, flexibility in terms of uh, voicing your opinions in certain culture. The US system is very open in that regard, um, sometimes annoyingly so, uh, but uh, there is very less hierarchy in terms of uh, these structures as such. Some places are more structured. Uh, I think in general eastern, the countries in the east, um, Japan, China, India, South Korea, uh, our system is very traditional. So, there is this respect for the elderly, which is good, but I think, so we have to do the opposite. We have to be more open in terms of voicing our ideas. Uh, we have to uh, be more uh, fearless in terms of, okay, we can be wrong, but it is fine. I mean, it is, I have this question, let me ask this question. Maybe people will think I am stupid, let them think I am stupid, but I am here to learn, why would not I uh, use that opportunity. But in the west, I think in general it is very good to be open, but also it is good, very important to value knowledge and wisdom. So, if somebody is experienced, somebody has read hundreds of papers in the field and has worked in the field for uh, many years. So, then you have to, their opinion values more, right, because they are more experienced. So, uh, there are these differences that exist and then of course, there are lab to lab differences, uh, some which you will find in every country. There are some labs where the professor takes um, total control of everything, we call this the micromanaging labs. So, they would stand behind and um, see what experiments you are doing. Um, can work for some people who want that kind of environment, it gets things moving very fast, but it is not good for your intellectual uh, development in research. Uh, but then the other side is more uh, laid back, where you just go and meet the professor once a week, once a month or something. And in that case, it gives you more intellectual freedom, but things move very slowly because you make a lot of mistakes and then you learn from your mistakes. So, there are these different things that, different styles of mentoring. There is a difference in lab size. I worked in small labs with uh, 5 or 6 people and I worked in huge labs, uh, 25, 30 people uh, and then that creates a lot of dynamics in the lab. How many PhD students there are, how many postdocs there are, that also matters uh, in terms of determining the culture of the lab. Uh, because postdocs tend to be more uh, focused and goal oriented, PhD students are more exploratory to begin with. Uh, also, uh, you had a very good academic uh, record and uh, you were a gold medalist of your batch. So, how does that affected your years after ISER and like in PhD and postdoc? Honestly, maybe it just helped with my PhD application. And I think it matters more in India in terms of they look at your like if you apply for a job here, professor job, they would ask for your 10th mark sheet, which I am like if I have done a PhD, I definitely have a 10th, I have passed class 10th, right. But here they ask for all those mark sheets, uh, while the system is more forgiving uh, in the US, where even if you struggled in college and if you somehow made it to a PhD program and if you did well in your PhD, nobody is going to look at your grades. Uh, only in your PhD grades matter, but again, if you have published papers in, as an undergraduate, then they are ready to uh, adjust in that regard, um, give an opportunity to the person. Nothing in postdoctoral, I, I think in postdoctoral stage uh, or later grades do not matter at all. Having said that, it is important to also learn because there is no substitute for knowledge. I mean, you have to acquire deep knowledge in your field if you want to be a scientist because unfortunately, there can be a bad or average gardener or an average engineer, but you can't be an average scientist because the government gives money to answer biological questions or any scientific questions and they would always give it to the best person. They would not give it to the second best person, right? So, we have to strive for excellence. I know it is very stressful. It is a stressful job. You have to always keep up with the what the other labs in the world are uh, studying and uh, be at the edge of knowledge, but that is also the fun of things that when you do an experiment, you get a result. You are the first person in the world to know that fact of knowledge and nobody else knows. So, that is the joy of things. The stress is you have to be uh, engaged all the time um, intellectually. Uh, 
um, some people do it more than others but i think yeah i i there are other people from my batch who are not gold medalists but they are they have done exceptionally well much better than me did better phd's better post docs uh, some of them even have faculty positions right now one uh, my roommate just joined iit delhi um roommate from iser um so he joined iit delhi as a professor um there's one in iit gandhinagar so yeah of course the timeline is different we know that uh, things move a little bit faster in math and theoretical physics so these people are already professors where i'll be ready in another uh, couple of years but uh, yeah i think grades matter but they don't matter beyond a point i think grades is just uh, and don't focus too much on the grades i would say that uh, honestly strive to be average overall of course you will i got uh, i got almost c in one of the courses but it's fine i mean that's not something that i was good at so it's okay but aim to be good at what interests you and try to maintain at least average grades in the other subjects and uh, that helps in the long run in terms of your knowledge across fields because you will be surprised to know how much even though we work in one area how much we have to read outside our field and the better scientists are always the ones who have knowledge outside their uh, core domain thank you feel free to ask any question okay i'm aditya and uh, i'm like interested in uh, ethology mostly and like multiple topics in ethology so i don't know what i want to choose one and uh, there are like multiple professors who are working on the same topic and like also multiple different parts of ethology so i don't know who to talk to and like uh, which part of ethology do i want to go into and like uh, how do i decide how do i experience everything in like the short time i have yeah that's a very big struggle always the struggle i would say talk to all of them talk to all of them get a feel there's of course the science but at this stage i think getting the right environment to study you can always switch later if you have some ethology background you can switch ethology you mentioned uh, so you can switch to another field you're still too early in your career but go to a place where you might have more interactions with the professor or uh, talk to them see how much time they spend and if they have like a specific project in mind for you or you'll be just wandering around in the lab as such talk to the people in the lab uh, people in general are very honest uh, how is the professor how much time do they give you uh, what is their mentoring style are they very hands on or are they very hands off they uh, and uh, ask the people what uh, the people who are working in the field tell them that these are the things that interest me what do you think will be a big thing in the future in ethology uh, sometimes we think that we know what is hot in uh, a particular field but it is evolving so rapidly that you have to talk to the people who are actually doing research and they might be able to tell you what is going to happen 5 years 10 years from now uh, so talk to as many people as possible there's no harm in that and uh, definitely talk to the people in the lab for sure thank you any other questions yeah over here so my name is sakshi so my question is as you said you went to japan in second year so is it necessary to know japanese to work there uh, uh, so they don't want to f you to feel that way because then many people would not go there right uh, it's a very uh, welcoming culture as well so this institution 
there are certain institutions where a lot of seminars and other things are in Japanese. This institution and many other top institutions definitely want to do things in English. So, but having said that, most of the people have very uh, uh, weak English speaking skills. So, what happened is the seminars were all in English, but because the PhD students actually memorized the uh, lectures, the entire thing and they have the notes in the slide. So, they were uh, reading from it sometimes. Uh, this is not universal. Some people, some Japanese people have very good English by the way. Uh, I am talking about the average uh, uh, person. And then when it came to the question and answer session, it becomes very difficult for them to understand the question and answer in English. So, then it goes in Japanese and then I was feeling a bit left out. Uh, but the professors, because most of them have worked outside Japan, were fluent in English, uh, both in writing as well as speaking. Uh, the PhD students could communicate to some extent. Outside, you will struggle because this is a culture where in Tokyo maybe it is ok, but if you go to, I was in this uh, city known as, uh, you can call it a city, it is a small city, big town sort of, it is called Mishima, it is between Tokyo and Kyoto, uh, it is a smallish um, town and over there it, people do not understand right, left, yes, no. So, you have to learn some, um, but I think the back then I did not even have a smartphone, I had a regular phone. We had a dictionary that we are carrying at places. Now, uh, I, I guess many of you are familiar with the Duolingo app where you can learn languages. So, I am learning Spanish right now. It has Japanese as well. So, you can learn Japanese. There is Google Translate that you just point your camera at something and it tells you what is it. So, it, life is much easier. I mean, we had so much struggle. Uh, we wanted to explore the country, uh, but then if you had to communicate with someone, it was a struggle, but they were also very considerate that they got a Japanese teacher who used to teach us Japanese twice a week um, and we learned the basic things, the numbers, asking for directions, um, food stuff, how to tell I am a vegetarian and things like that. Uh, so, they were very welcoming. I was very tempted to go there. Uh, was just because I had another offer, uh, if I did not have that offer, I would have possibly joined uh, the PhD program. I have one another question, like how to manage academics and like college life enjoyment. So, can you tell Yeah, that is, I think for everyone, it is different. It depends, you should definitely enjoy college life. So, I think I enjoyed college life a lot in my first two years. Um, I was part of IPL of course, the famous IPL, we started the IPL, uh, they still call it the IPL right, yeah. And then uh, I was part of the drama club, so we uh, used to have this uh, Karwa, is, yeah. So, back then it was all in-house performances, so we used to do drama, people used to do dance and there was all these things going on. And of course, sports and other activities as such. But when I committed to a lab, then especially because biological research, experimental research requires you to be physically present in the lab. You cannot do research after going back to the hostel, right. So, I had to contribute and then I uh, maintained my uh, support system, the friends who I used to hang out with after lab, uh, but I could not do as many activities as I wanted to. So, it was a sacrifice I did. Some of some of the people continued and they were much better at managing their times. But I would say that 5 years is also a long time. You, you need your support system. Find the people who you would really, uh, who can, who you can share your frustrations with. Uh, because after one point your parents can support you, but they cannot understand your problems. So, you definitely need your friend circle and these will I mean, we have the WhatsApp groups and also these are people who will stay friends for life and you definitely want to build those relationships that can help you deal with the tough times um, in college. Uh, it is very essential. You are, uh, people are far from home, COVID times in general are stressful um, because uh, uh, of multiple reasons but you want to spend time with friends. For us, the fun thing was the mess used to be closed on Saturday nights. 
So, we used to go to other parts of Pune and we have wonderful memories of these uh, Saturday night dinners. We used to meet other people in the restaurants because end of the day it is not that big a city. So, uh, so yeah, I have a lot of memories. Uh, spend quality time, I mean they say this, this very cliche that work hard, party harder sort of a thing. So, you really have to uh, find things that give you enjoyment. Okay, this is for extroverts, they would like to talk to people and stuff. For introverts, they would like to spend more alone time. But whatever helps you relax, find that thing. Uh, it's important to maintain your fitness levels as well. Uh, so do some physical activity, walk around the campus, play some sport. Uh, you otherwise you will get burnt out, and you'll not enjoy the process. You'll not have good college uh, memories. Uh, it, it's the balance, and you'll know what the balance is, everyone prioritizes differently. Uh, but try out different things, do not miss out, do not, so that you do not have regrets later that I really wanted to do this, but I could not find the time. And it is, you know, it is fine, I mean you have, if you do bachelors and masters in different places, there is a lot of stress, you have to apply in your third year to these places and get adjust to this new place. Here you are with a group of people for a very long period of time. So, it gives you the time to make long term connections, gives you the flexibility to think about careers, even if you do a mistake now, people have changed their majors and other things much later. So, it, it gives you the option to explore more, you can make a few mistakes, do not worry too much about it. Uh, you can retake a course if needed and um, that option is always there. Thank you sir. Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, I'm Abhinav, and I j it's a very informal question. But seeing you be the person you are, you've gone through multiple stages. You've attempted multiple biological problems, and I just wanted to ask whether you could talk to us about some definitive experiences in your life that you've had, like a quote from a book, or a book, or some person telling you some random thing that you found it to be so profound that it changed you and some little way and you, when you look back at the past 10 to 12 years of your academic life, you think to that point and you are like, okay, that, that, was, that had some significant impact on where I am today. Yeah, thinking about it, uh, I think at one point, I do not know if I read it in a book or somewhere or on the internet, I do not know. So, this was during my ICER years. Uh, this was about being humble. Being humble uh, is really important because if you are not humble, you are not able to see the perspectives of other people. So, that has changed my life philosophy a lot because I used to be this, I think I still am a very competitive, aggressive person. But I felt that you have to be humble, you have to be a good listener so that you can understand what are the challenges people are facing. Uh, somebody might have not scored well in an exam, but something might have happened in their family that have caused that. So, you have to be supportive to people, uh, you have to be humble, uh, only then you can keep your uh, feet on the ground and proceed. So, this is more of a like very personality thing. Uh, science related stuff, very interesting stuff happened during my PhD. Uh, so, it is very interesting. So, my PhD went for long because I was studying aging and each aging experiment because you have to start from the birth till the death of the animal is uh, even though C. elegans is very short lived, it still the one aging experiment goes on for one and a half months and then you have to do replicates. So, it stretches out. So, mine was a 7 year PhD, uh, which is long, but not extremely long because people sometimes go longer. Uh, so, till the middle of my fourth year, I had bits and pieces of data. I did not have a central story. So, everything happened after that. Uh, so, one of my committee members, in that committee meeting, I was very negative about stuff, I guess. Uh, it was not conscious, but unconsciously. They said that uh, you should uh, do this. And I said, ah, we can do this, but there is this problem, uh, there is this technical challenge, why we cannot do this. Then he asked another question, I gave similar answer, ah, but this cannot be done, because this, this might fail. So, he said that, see, if you want to be a scientist, you have to do things that others are not able to do. If you say that this is difficult, nobody has done it so far. Why would somebody hire you to be a scientist? We are hiring you to solve questions that nobody has solved before. 
So, you can become a good scientist only if you go and solve problems that nobody has solved addressed before and if it requires making a tool, make a tool. Only then you will be remembered in the field, only then people will cite your work that this person first made this tool. If you are just a person who wants to benefit from what others are doing and just use their tools, you do not matter that much to the community. So, I think that really changed my approach. Uh, you have to be more risk taking which does not come naturally to many middle class uh, Indian people. We just want to do what is easy and follow the shortcuts to get to our goal, uh, but you have to take risks. You have to uh, that is why you need some level of privilege to do research because uh, you should be if you uh, have a lot of responsibilities in family then it is very difficult to take such big risks that okay, I am moving to a foreign land for uh, 10 years of my life and uh, uh, but then if you can afford to take those risks definitely take those risks. Think you have to think more independently and uh, think more freely in terms of what you want to do. Do not restrict yourself to what others have done. Thank you, thank you for that. Sir, uh, how you manage all financial stuff and all, especially in PhD? So, that was another reason. So, back then the PhD salary in India was very bad. It was uh, something around between 10 to 15 thousand rupees every month, which is not enough if you are living in a big city like Pune or Bangalore. Uh, and I definitely did not want to burden my family because my family was not in a position to keep sending money for extended periods. Uh, US has some of the best PhD stipends. Uh, it depends on the city you are living in. If you are living in a big city uh, like New York or Los Angeles, then you will merely, merely break even at that point with your salary. But because I was in a college town where the u it was primarily the university and some people who lived there, but university was the biggest employer. Uh, so, expenses were very less. I could save a lot of money. Uh, I in fact, bought a car in my second year of PhD. Uh, it was a used car, but then uh, I saved enough money to buy a car. Uh, I saved enough money to buy international tickets uh, for myself and I also invited my parents and my uh, sister to visit me in the US. Uh, so, I could host them. Uh, it is not a lot of money, but it is reasonable that you can uh, support yourself. It gets difficult if you are married and your spouse does not work, because, uh, but people have still been able to survive. Um, you have to make lifestyle changes, but people have been able to survive in uh, one person salary, but again in smaller cities. In bigger cities like New York and all it is you need both members earning. So, uh, my wife is also a scientist. She is uh, a cancer biologist who studies interactions between the immune system and uh, cancer cells. So, both of us are postdocs and we get postdoctoral salaries and that is enough for us to survive in New York. I would say just enough for us to survive in New York, uh, but yeah if it is one person supporting their entire family then it can get very difficult. You have to live completely outside the city and commute uh, otherwise the rent is too high. Um, so, financially I think if you go abroad your financial uh, condition is slightly better um, in that way. It is still not as high as the IT jobs and other things in those countries, but it is still enough to you will be like my salary is higher than my salary alone uh, not uh, combined with my wife is uh, maybe at the, s the median income of the city. So, it is reasonable I mean you will find something some place to live uh, food is expensive, but yeah these are the main expenses uh, it is ok I mean it is manageable. I, I think the pe only people who struggle are who have a shopping problem because these Apple products come and then if you keep buying the new iPhone every time then you will be in a problem. So, yeah, that's a Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. There is a question in the live. Mm -hmm. So, there is a question uh, in the live audience. Uh, so, Manas Raikar asked, hello Surojit, thanks for being here. 
I was curious to know how do you keep up with the literature being published, especially in hot fields like neuroscience or cancer biology? Yeah, it's difficult. It's a struggle for everyone, not just me, to read everything. Uh, use Google Scholar alerts. So what you can do is put in the keywords in Google Scholar and then make an email alert that any time a paper is published with these keywords, you will get an email with the list of papers. Uh, that is primarily, Twitter has been very useful even though there is a lot of distracting material as well. But follow the people who share papers. Uh, I am one of those people, uh, I, I tweet any paper that I would want to read, so it is like a bookmark for me. Uh, and then many people follow me for that reason just to get the papers. But I, I mostly tweet within my field, C. elegans neuroscience and sometimes other stuff as well if I find them interesting. So, these are two ways to keep up. Uh, attend a lot of talks because you never know uh, if some paper will come up, some technique will come up that will be useful in your own research. Uh, another thing is that it takes lesser and lesser time to understand what is in a paper once you, as you progress in your career. Uh, when I, when Mayurika gave me the first review to read, it took me I think one semester to read that review and understand everything because I was googling every single word in that, I could not understand anything. But the more you read, the more you understand the techniques, the more you understand the approach and then once you reach the professor level then just by reading the abstract and quickly skimming through the figures, you know what is in the paper. You make more connections, you get to see the work in conferences before it is published. So, in conferences you actually hear the scientists talk about the work. So, you get a very close view of what uh, went into the paper and then you know exactly what is in the paper. Uh, but reaching there needs working in a field for 10, 15 years. Initially, you have to struggle, you have to read a lot and there is unfortunately no alternative for that. Uh, there are many uh, articles on how to read a scientific paper, you do not start from the beginning. Uh, I mean of course, you read the abstract, uh, you would want to read the introduction if the field is new for you, uh, go to the results, do not read the methods to begin with, go to the methods only if you want to repeat the experiments and then read the discussion, that is very helpful in understanding how it fits in the context of what we currently know in the field. Uh, you can skip the methods unless if you want to repeat that experiment in your own lab or something. Uh, so, there are different ways of reading a paper. Uh, you can read the abstract and title in 30 seconds and if it is not directly related, I would not go any further. Uh, then there are papers where I would quickly go through everything figure by figure and see what they have done uh, and then quickly s read through things. Uh, so, it is maybe 2, 3 hours of reading the paper and then there is the deep reading of papers where it is, if it is very similar to what you are interested in and then you have to spend a day or two evaluating everything uh, in the paper. I review uh, articles for many scientific journals, uh, uh, eLife communication biology and so on. So, I get those papers and I have to give my feedback in terms of uh, what are the weaknesses of the study and then I have to even read the background of those fields sometimes. Sometimes I am familiar, sometimes I have to go to the references and read those references references to understand how this fits in the broader context and then it takes me two days, sometimes even more to uh, give the comments on the strengths and weaknesses of the paper. So, it varies, you would definitely early in your career you would want to read more broadly. Uh, by default it gets more and more narrow as you progress in your career. Uh, and, but it also takes you shorter to read a paper than what it does when you are um, an undergrad or early career researcher. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions? Okay, I think uh, it is past 8 too because we have to <laughs> dinner time <laughs> is also sure. coming close. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you so much uh, Surajit for this wonderful session.
um, it was very heartwarming to see your days in ISA. Then we came to your summer internships, and uh, we learned about what you do, what you did in your MS thesis, your PhD uh, career, and then now moving on to po postdoc research as well, uh, and how your life is in New York, the financial status, your teaching experience as well. So it is very enlightening to see someone from ISER moving into all these paths. And it is it, it just helps us in our future too. Uh, so I thank everyone who has joined here today and also our live audience. I um, sincerely thank uh, Dr. Mayuri Kaleri for giving us this opportunity to meet Surajit and like, have this wonderful session with him. Uh, I thank the entire uh, team of Science Club for help organizing this event and our past coordinators who have, have helped us a lot in making this event possible. Uh, so hold on to your seats. There are more Science Club events coming up. Uh, we'll keep updating you on our Instagram and uh, through mails. So please be in line. And thank you all for this session. Thank you. Thank you, Th thank you Avantika, for organizing this. Yeah.